Good afternoon, everybody. We're so glad you've joined us for our um, author speed dating this afternoon. We have quite an international crew here today with people from as far away as London and Canada and DC and Chicago and Lisbon and even California. So we're really thrilled to have everybody presenting their books here with, with us today. Um, and I am going to turn it over to Susie Ho from Hickleby's, uh, who will do the introductions for the authors today. Hello, everyone. Our first speaker today will be Laura Gao. Hello, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's such an honor to be featured amongst all these amazing authors and books out there. Um, my name is Laura Gal, and this is my book, Messy Roots. It's my debut graphic memoir um, about my life growing up as a queer Chinese American immigrant from Wuhan, China, uh, growing up in a small town in Texas that's predominantly white and conservative um, and then later on finding kind of my home here in San Francisco but then having everything kind of turned around once again when COVID hits and um, who I thought I was and what I thought was my home um, becomes something that is to be rediscovered again as I go through this book. Um, I'm actually currently in Lisbon but uh, a funny story was I was showing this book around to some folks over here and uh, I didn't know this, but apparently Lisbon has the same exact bridge as San Francisco. So a bunch of folks were like, oh my God, you wrote a book about Lisbon. I was like, no, so close. It's San Francisco, <laughs> but maybe, maybe a next book, you know? Um, so yeah, I usually will go through in these presentations, like, you know, talk about how I got started with this book, what the inspiration is from. Um, but I've done quite a few of these to where I probably sound like a broken record. You know, we get it. She's from Wuhan, COVID hit, yada, yada. So I want to try something new this time and show you uh, a part of the book that I haven't shown before. And this is my author's letter to young readers who will pick this up and read it for the very first time on the inside cover. So here we go. Hey there, I'm writing this letter just days after the Atlanta mass shooting that killed six Asian women in March of 2021. Asian Americans across the nation united in protest despite dangers of becoming victims of people or pandemic. By the time you read this, will our cries still ring as loudly or have they shriveled up into a distant whisper as with most Asian American issues? You may feel angry, hurt, misunderstood, and everything in between. I hear you. When my beautiful hometown and community became scapegoats for COVID-19, I felt the same frenzy of emotions. After being silent for most of my life, I poured my heart into a webcomic called The Wuhan I Know. When it unexpectedly went viral, I received countless helps, countless heartwarming notes from people around the world. The one that struck me the most was from a mother with two young Asian American daughters. Scared of the world that her daughters will grow up in, she thanked me for creating something that will help them be proud of their identity. I was elated, but hesitant. I mean, was a simple 10 panel comic enough to accomplish such a feat? Furthermore, was I a 23 year old still playing identity tug of war with my poor therapist? <laughs> a qualified narrator. I wanted to scream at the screen, but I can't even use chopsticks correctly. <laughs> However, as I started writing a response for these girls, I realized that there was someone else that I had desperately needed to talk to. And that was younger Laura. And that's how this book began. My search for identity and home never tied neatly into the perfect hero's journey. And honestly, I'd rather face a 10 headed dragon over myself any day. Wounds inflicted by a dragon will heal as cool scars that you can show off, but wounds inflicted by yourself and those around you are constantly reopened, scraped with salt 
and is covered up by bandages of shame. Identity was the beast trapped in those wounds. Only by letting it out could I truly start healing. So to all the other younger Lauras out there reading this, please treat your beast kindly because one day it will become your roar. This book is an anthem sung from the deepest parts of my heart. Thank you so much for letting me share it with you. So yeah, that is my book. If you're interested in seeing more of like the beautiful art along with like my writing inside, definitely, you know, request it, uh, request advanced readers copy from Harper. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. That was beautiful. Our next speaker is Catherine. Hi, first of all, I wanted to say I'm honored to be amongst such esteemed authors and um, illustrators too, I think. Um, and I um, wanted to say lunch every day came about um, when I was actually um, speaking at a conference about one um, at a international bullying prevention association conference thing. And anyways, an educator named Jim came up to me and he's like, you should come to my schools. You know, I'm doing all these, you know, prevention programs and kindness um, initiatives. And I'm like, sure, that'd be great. And anyways, um, he kept inviting me back over time and we became friends. And um, one day over lunch, he, I was literally kind of oozing my praise for him because I just think he's just a wonderful human being. And he kind of looked at me and he said, you know, Catherine, I need to let you know when I was growing up, I was kind of a bully growing up. And I'm like, he's like, yeah, I used to take this kid's lunch at school every day. And I'm like, you did? I'm like, oh my God, you know, like what turned you around? And so that's kind of the story of lunch every day. It's so short. Um, I'm just going to show you some of the pages, but the gist of it is, oh, and by the way, um, I said, Jim, you should, you should write a book about that. You should tell the story. And he's like, I'm not going to do it. He's like, but you can. And I'm like, I'm not going to tell your story. You tell it. So that went on for quite a while. And then it just kind of spilled out of me. And I'm like, Ooh, I hope he likes it. Um, so it starts off with Jim in the school um, schoolyard. And he said, there he is. Just look at him. Skinny kid slumping, you know, gosh, is there a base behind all that hair? You know, I can topple him with a tap. And he says, um, so one of the things that Jim talked with me about is the label of being a bully. He said, actually, I wasn't just taking that kid's lunch just to be mean. He said there was actually a huge free lunch sign that the whole school could see. And he didn't want the whole school to know that, you know, he um, couldn't afford to, to pay for his own lunch. And um, so he says, mm, at least his lunch is good, better than mine. Bet his home is better than mine too. Older brothers, you know. And I found out Jim actually had five older brothers, so things were very tight. And he said, next day at school, I shove him extra hard just because I can. And um, someone sees him do it, and he's sent to the office, and he kind of is in the principal's office, and the principal's talking about his potential, and he's like, blah, 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 yeah. Um, I look down like I feel bad. Mostly, I just feel mad. And things really don't change at all um, until um, one day uh, Skinny Kid invites everyone over to his house for a birthday party, including Jim. And everybody's super excited to go and he's kind of like, yeah, whatever, I'm so not going to that. And the morning of, he actually has a change of heart and he puts on his best shirt and goes. And everyone's holding a gift and Jim, Jimmy puts his hands in his pockets. And it's this big deal even to kind of cross to this other neighborhood, um, going down the pathway up the stairs. And basically everyone is celebrating in the kitchen. And Jim, Jimmy's thinking about leaving. He's like, um, I don't belong here. 
and he slumps down in a chair. And as he's thinking about leaving, the mom of Skinny Kid pokes her head in the doorway and she sees him. She sees me like sees me. And she knows exactly who Jimmy is. And she marches right up to him. And he's like, oh my God, she is going to yell at me in front of everyone. She says in a real quiet voice, Jimmy, what would you like for lunch tomorrow? I hear you like my lunches. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make you a second lunch and my son will bring it for you every day. Okay? And he says, and you know something? She did. And that's how I got lunch every day and a whole lot more. So here's Jim, um, one of the most remarkable human beings I've ever met. Um, and it's also dedicated to the lady who made all those lunches for him. But um, for me, um, this story really has three heroes. Jim, who changed things in his own direction, um, the woman who made all those lunches for him, but also the little boy who must have seen beyond that tough exterior to want to include him. So Jim, has um, helped over like literally thousands and thousands of kids. Um, and I'm just really grateful um, to be able to share the story with you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that story, Catherine. I'm sure Jim loves it. <laughs> <laughs> Our next speaker is Tom Gold. Hello. Um... My name's Tom Gold, and this is my, my book, The Little Wooden Robot and the Log Princess. Um, I've been an illustrator and a cartoonist for quite a few years now, and I've wanted to do a kid's book probably as long as I've been making illustrations, but I could never find a story which felt right, that felt like a, a story I wanted to put my time into telling and illustrating. Um, so I spent years not making a story. And then I had two daughters and I started making up bedtime stories for them. And I'd make up a different story every night. And I found that the things we, we all really loved were fairy tales. Sometimes I'd take real fairy tales and retell them as best as I could remember. <clears throat> and sometimes I'd take the elements of those fairy tales and play with them and put the girls into the stories. And I began to realize that maybe a fairy tale was the right um, story for me. So I, I looked through my favorites, the Grimm's fairy tales, trying to find a story which felt like the right thing to tell. But either they seemed too well known and everybody knew the story or they weren't well known. And that was because they were completely terrifying or completely insane, or had some terrible sort of know your place moral or something really odd about them, which my kids didn't, um, didn't like. But I still wanted to tell a fairy tale. And my younger daughter, Iris, her nickname in the family is the log, because she sleeps like a log every night thoroughly and wakes up completely refreshed. And one night I made up a story for them, which is what, the, what became the book about a little princess, um, there she is, who is born to parents who can't have children and they instead a witch enchants a log. And every night the girl turns into a log when she falls asleep and every morning she's woken with some magic words which turn her back into a human. And those magic words are said by her brother, a little wooden robot. And the story begins when one morning he forgets to wake her and she, like any log found lying around in the castle, is thrown out of the window and rolls down the hill. And the adventures begin when her brother goes on this great adventure to rescue his sister. And then as the story goes on, uh, he gets into trouble and she has to rescue him. And I wanted to play with all my favorite sort of tropes of fairy tales, but have a real, um, make a real melange of all my favorite things and just treat myself to all the, the things I want to illustrate and all the things I love about fairy tales. So one thing I love about fairy tales is 
there's not just one magical thing in my mind. They happen in a fairy tale world. So I have a map in the story where some of the things in the story appear in the map, but there's also all these other things hidden around there that hopefully will inspire children to imagine other fairy tales in that world. And I also have some elements in the story where instead of telling whole stories, I give these mini fairy tales where there's just an illustration and a title. So we've got the giant's key, the family of robbers, the old lady in a bottle, the magic pudding, the lonely bear, the queen of the mushrooms. And he gets a set of adventures and then his sister gets a set of adventures as well. The mischievous pixies, the dragon's egg, the feuding hunters, the haunted well, the enormous blackbird, and the baby in a rose bush. And those are my way of sneaking even more fairy tales into my story. And um, the other thing I wanted it to do was to work really well as a bedtime story, a story that's told to children, perhaps by a tired parent at the end of a long day. So I spent a lot of time with my kids reading them the story and working on the text to try and make it sound as good in the mouth and performed even by a terrible actor like me. So we collaborated on that. So I really have to thank Daphne and Iris for their hard work on the story. And um, I hope you and whatever child this is bought for um, enjoy the story as much as we enjoyed making it. Thanks. Thank you. Everyone loves a good fairy tale, right? Um, our next speaker is Lauren Sala. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Lauren, and this is my book, Mi Casa is My Home, out from Candlewick. Um, this book follows a very spirited Lucia, totally based on my daughter, Lucia, <laughs> uh, through her charming yellow house. Um, as she leads us into each room and tells us about why it's special to her. So she starts at La Puerta, where Abuela likes to wave to the neighbors, totally based on my grandmother who would wave to the neighbors and then gossip about them later, but I don't put that in the book. <laughs> um, she then goes to La Cocina, where everyone gathers and Lucia watches her mama turn empty pots and pans into soups and arroces. In the bathroom is where she shaves her barba con Abuelo, which I'm sure we all have done <laughs> as a kid. And it's on the patio where she puts on magic shows with her cousins and the cousins of her cousins. In the end, Lucia learns that the best part of home is family, which is so sweet. You can see them in the end papers, it's like all the little family portraits on her walls. Um, so I got the inspiration for this book when my mom put my childhood home on the market. And I almost hyperventilated because I was an only child and my house was like my best friend. <laughs> I mean, I was like so lonely. So it was like, oh, look, the closet is my where I'm going to be today. Um, so that house had just known me my whole life. It was at all my birthday parties. It held me when I cried. I knew I was getting taller when my hiding spots got smaller, which is one of the lines from the book. Um, there was even a tree outside that was planted on the day I was born. So when my mom put up for sale, I was freaking out and I realized that a home can be so special. I, I really didn't realize it before that. Um, thankfully, the market was horrible at the time, so she couldn't sell it and I can still go visit it whenever I want. <laughs> but um, what I love most about this book is that besides being cozy and sweet and warm and a love poem about where you live, it's written in my favorite language, which is Spanglish. Um, I come from a Spanish, well, I come from, my, da my dad's Spanish and Puerto Rican, but my dad wanted to be American, so he didn't teach me to speak Spanish, which is crazy because Spanish is very American language. Um, but when I was 14, I realized what a tragedy that was. And I started learning. I moved to Spain as soon as I could. I became as fluent as possible, um, but still I forget a word sometimes and I feel self-conscious. So I just kind of like always go to Spanglish, which I realized a lot of my Hispanic Latinx friends uh, feel the same way. We all just kind of like revert to Spanglish when we forget a word. And I realized it's a beautiful language because when you're bilingual, you have double the vocabulary and you can look outside, you see trees and arboles. And so it's awesome. You can just pick the one word that feels the prettiest and go with that. So I just love playing with 
Spanglish and writing poetry in both languages and mixing it up and having double the vocabulary. And it's so cool that Candlewick saw that vision and let me seamlessly switch back and forth in this book. Um, the School Library Journal said it's a must buy for Latinx kids, which warms my heart. They also say you can still figure it out um, from the context as well. So yay, everybody can relate to this book. I really hope to, um, from this book, find this, help people find the sweet things they love about where they live. Um, Cause sometimes it's hard to do that. When I, when I was growing up in that house, I hated it. I was embarrassed to have people over. I was like, oh, my carpet's ugly or whatever. And then when it was on the market, I realized how special the things are. So in writing the book, I realized the secret to happiness. And so I've been taking that to schools and kids, but the secret to happiness guys is that wherever you are, you can look around and find some detail that you love. And that if you do that, you can write some pretty cool poems. So I just <laughs> recommend right now, you look where you, where you are and find some cool things that you love, even if it's just like the color of a plant or the shape of your closet. I mean, you can come up with some really lovely things. And even if you're on a stinky bus, you can find a color that you love and focus on that. And that is the secret to happiness. Anyway, that's a side note, but <laughs> I hope that people do get that from my book. And I hope that people relate to the book in its language in the two languages that they speak. I just wanna help people learn to play with language. But what I love more than Spanglish and gratitude is that is independent bookstores. So you are doing such important work. Thank you for making it through the past year. However you did it, I'd love to visit your store and we'll write poems. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Your book was like a hug when I read it for the first time. Um, our next speaker is Kekla Magoon. Hello. I am Kekla, and this is my book, Revolution in Our Time, The Black Panther Party's Promise to the People. It is very, very big, and I'm so excited um, that it is real and I have it in my hand. Finally, the hardcover <laughs> is here. It's coming out this month, or well, in November, uh, within the month. I'm counting down. Um, and this is a nonfiction book about the Black Panther Party. It is written for a teen audience, so it's marked for 12 and up. I do think because it's so big and so colorful and full of archival photos that it will cross over potentially as a, an adult uh, coffee table book because it look how thick it is it's so big. Um, and it has very, very beautiful illustrations, um, a lot of um, archival photos and um, just everything like color um, to color. Uh, on the inside um, and so many, so many amazing photos, like almost every spread has some kind of imagery on it. Um, and my book designer did a really, really wonderful job creating the opening chapter spreads, um, which I had one to show you, but I lost it. Uh, <laughs> I lost my place, uh, but I'll show it to you now. So there's one of the opening spreads with the beautiful blue. Um, but this is a nonfiction book about the Black Panther Party. Most people don't know much about the Black Panther Party, if anything. Um, it, they haven't been taught much in, the, in our history classes. They haven't been written about much in our history book. Um, but the fact of the matter is the Black Panthers were a community organizing group that arose out of the civil rights movement at the end of the civil rights movement. If you know anything at all about the Black Panther Party, you probably know this one single snapshot image of Black men with guns marching through their communities, trying to claim power for themselves and for their communities. And that's a, such a simplistic image when it comes to the Black Panther Party. They uh, did not advocate violence. They carried guns to protect their community from police brutality, from white supremacist violence that was being inflicted upon them day in, day out, year after year, decade after decade, century after century. This was not a new phenomenon in the 1960s. Um, and when we talk about the 1960s, when we talk about the civil rights movement, we so often frame it in terms of nonviolent resistance. We talk about peaceful protest. And the reason that peaceful protest was so powerful in its day was that it was peaceful protest and nonviolent resistance in response to extreme violence. Civil rights movement protesters were beaten, jailed, sprayed with fire hoses so hard their skin came off. They were chased by dogs, right? They were killed. People showed up to demonstrate and fight for what they believed in, knowing they were putting their lives on the line. And after decades of doing that, many, many young people decided, you know what? We have had enough of not fighting back. That urge to fight back was there. It was strong. It was powerful. And what the Panthers did 
rather than leaning into that desire for violence, that desire to lash out in response to brutality, they said, hey, we're gonna do something else with that energy. We're gonna turn it to community organizing. We're gonna turn it to voter registration. We're gonna turn it to feeding our people, opening health clinics, opening schools. We're going to educate ourselves and our communities about the struggles that we've been going through on this continent for 400 years. And that was an incredibly powerful decision that they made, an incredibly powerful moment in history. And so in this book, I look at the landscape of Black history that led up to the civil rights movement. I look at the nonviolent civil rights movement organizing, the frustrations that arose out of nonviolent civil rights organizing, and then the Black power movement that emerged, including the Black Panthers. Um, and then once I've talked about the Panthers in this book, I look at where we are today, what has happened in the decades since the Panthers were active, which was 1966 to 1980 ish. And you know, so much has happened since then. We see ourselves in a time and place when the things that we saw in the news in the 1960s are once again in the news. We see police brutality, we see violence, we see a, res a, a resistance to teaching Black history, right, in our national conversation right now. These are things that the Panthers fought against. The Panthers are the reason that we even teach <laughs> Black history at all. And so in this moment when we are seeing a, a lot of backlash against teaching American history in a thorough and diverse way. Um, it's really important to me to see a book like this shelved in bookstores, to see it in libraries, to see it in schools, to see it discussed and talked about and shared. And so I'm really excited to be able to share it with you. Um, this is, again, it's 400 pages, about 300 pages of text and 100 pages of back matter talking about the Panthers and trying to just express everything um, about them and, and try to uh, undo some of the misconceptions about the, the organi organizing that they did. Um, this is, like I said, for 12 and up, but I think it can go as far up as you want. Uh, I think adults will enjoy it as well. Um, I have a website attached to the book. It's revolutioninourtime.com. I was super lucky to get that website and be able to, um, to build um, some reader resources there, classroom resources there for teachers. There's a Spotify playlist of music that inspired me during the writing. Um, and I will say, it is now a National Book Award finalist in the category of young people's literature. So just found out um, about a week and a half ago. So waiting eagerly to, to celebrate with my fellow finalists. And um, I'm just really delighted that this book has finally come out into the world. It's been about 10 years in the making in terms of research and, and process. So I hope you all enjoy it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you and congratulations. That's so exciting. Thanks. Our next speaker is Sherry Dimalein. Great. Thanks, Susie. Hi, my name is Sherry. I'm a member of the Georgia Bay Métis community uh, up here in Ontario, uh, part of the Great Lakes community. And my uh, home is actually on Anishinaabe land. Uh, my community was moved here a couple hundred years ago while we were kicked out of where we were and kind of put on boats and we ended up here. Uh, thankfully, the Anishinaabe people welcomed us. Um, Kakla, my God, congratulations. That's super exciting. I'm totally distracted now. Okay, my book. Uh, here we go. Uh, Hunting by Stars is, is my book. Uh, the cover was done by a Cree Métis artist, Stephen Gladue, um, and it's uh, YA crossover. It's, it's a book in the, in the universe of the Marrow Thieves, which is uh, a, a novel that I put out in 2017. Um, basically the question that guided this book was uh, in the apocalypse, how far would you go for your family? And would those actions uh, that you took turn you into the very thing that you're running from? So the, the sort of the log line, the, the premise, the summary of the story is, um, separated from his found family at a time when the population through cataclysmic climate change and, and sicknesses, if you can imagine that, uh, has stopped dreaming. And those that like him are hunted for this ability to dream. 17 year old Frenchie finds himself in the worst place imaginable. And in this world, it is the uh, new reiteration of the residential schools uh, that are in Canada that were in Canada up until the 90s or the Indian boarding schools that were in the United States. Uh, and now he just needs to decide how far he'll go to escape. Meanwhile, out in the woods, his found family deals with God everything. I really put them through it. Traps, a cult, vigilantes, birth, death, 
all the while trying to hold on to their dreams, including the one where Frenchie might still be alive, all the while they're moving farther away from each other. So there were a lot of themes uh, in, in this, the world of the Marrow Thieves in, in this book and Hunting by Stars. It's basically, which is not very basic, the, continua the continuation of colonization, which is an ongoing process. Uh, we often hear, you know, it was 400 years ago, why haven't indigenous people moved on? Well, it began 400 years ago. We are still uh, it, today living under the Indian Act. We are still on occupied territories. This is, it's, it's an ongoing process. Um, the book, more than anything, to me, is about the absolute unreasonableness of love. There is no reason why in an apocalypse, in these circumstances, these people should have the capacity for love, uh, that they should love each other, familial love, romantic love. It is completely unreasonable, and it is everywhere. Um, it talks about, you know, the survival of culture as central to overall survival. So not just who, you know, can we survive, but who do you want to be at the moment of your survival? It talks about the indigenous blueprint for, for survival, right? Like we as a people have, we've been through the apocalypse. There is, another, there is a, another side. At the end of the world, there are still worlds worth fighting for. Um, and it talks about that indigenous excellence, which is both re resistance and also this, this unending capacity for joy. Um, and I think if I had to sum up uh, Hunting by Stars, it would really be this, uh, that life is such a beautiful struggle. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Julian Randall. Hi everybody, my name is Julian Randall. I'm so excited to be here to talk to y'all. Uh, it's just, a, it's such a joy always to talk to fellow booksellers, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Like I said, my name is Julian Randall, uh, and I'm here to talk to you about a book that I've been waiting 20 years to write. So 20 years ago, when I was eight years old, uh, an earth shattering thing happened to me. I walked into my mother's room and I found her crying for the very first time in my entire life, which in and of itself shook me to my core. But she was crying over a book, which I absolutely never seen before. So I naturally had to figure out what was this story? What was this thing that could bring this emotion out of my mother, right? And it was a copy of Julia Alvarez's uh, In the Time of the Butterflies, which if you haven't had a chance to read it, is a story of uh, the three Mirabal sisters who were assassinated by Trujillo during the period of the Trujillo when he re re uh, reigned over the Dominican Republic for 31 years, completely uncontested, right? So I asked mom why the story was important. She said, these were the women who, read, who led the revolt against the men who uh, pushed your abuelo off the island. And from that, I wanted to know more. I came to my school library and I came to my local bookseller and nobody had any books that were appropriate for a kid my age to read. So 20 years later, I'm here to talk to you about Pilar Ramirez. Uh, you can see her there in the back. And this is the first book in a duology that begins March 1st, 2022. Pilar, like me, is from the Logan Square neighborhood of Chicago, uh, which is a working class Mexican Puerto Rican neighborhood on the northwest side of the city. So her block is my block, the gentrification she faces is my gentrification, the silences that she is trying to answer are the silences that I've been trying to answer all my life. Uh, so at 12 years old, she's an aspiring documentarian. She's trying to figure out what happened to her cousin, Natasha, who disappeared during Trujillo 50 years ago. So when she finds out that there's a U Chicago professor who does this exact line of work, she's on the next L train. She takes the blue, gets to the green, comes to the dude's office and like many professors, he's not there despite his office hours saying that he would be. So she decides to poke around a little bit like a good documentary filmmaker should. And she finds a folder with her cousin's exact name on it. But inside there's only a blank sheet of paper. But what she doesn't know is the minute that she touches that sheet of paper, she's gone. She's whisked away through the sheet of paper to a magical land called Zapa, which has all of Dominican mythos and magic and in it, she finds that her cousin didn't just disappear. She was kidnapped by the Dominican boogeyman, El Cuco, who was in league with Trujillo the entire time. So 
So now she has to find a way to not only get home, but to save her cousin. So throughout it, she meets uh, the three Mirabal sisters, the four Mirabal sisters rather, uh, represented as galipotes, uh, who are shapeshifters in Dominican culture and completely indestructible. They appear as butterflies. Uh, she meets not one, but hundreds of ciguabas, which is another Dominican myth in, in that she makes a best friend named Carmen who helps her figure out how are they going to get into La Blanca, uh, El Cuco's territory, save her cousin, find her power, find her way home. Um, so I am just so, so excited to have an opportunity to really connect with not just uh, Dominican kids, right? But even back when I was a bookseller at Bus Boys and Poets, I would have kids coming and asking me, do you have any stories about this element of my homeland or this element of my homeland? What does it mean for us to write stories for kids who are third generation from the impact of something historical? How do we model what it means to be not only heroic, but communally focused, familial? Uh, how do we validate those communal and familial ties, right? Because ultimately, my questions were about the Trujillo, my questions were about the island, but ultimately my questions were about my mother and her sisters and the ways that they were able to pepper in a little bit of Spanglish and save each other at each and every time. So I'm really excited to share Pilar with all of you. Once again, it drops March 1st, 2022. I'm so excited. Thank you so much. Looking forward to that exciting adventure. Our last speaker today is Jamar J. Perry. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, my name is Jamar J. Perry. I am the author of Cameron Battle and the Hidden Kingdoms. It is out February 1st, 2022 from Bloomsbury Children's Books. So here's this amazing cover. I think it's just amazing. Uh, Raymond Sebastian did it. So and it was just an amazing to just see a black boy on the cover and not only is he black but he's black and queer as well so having you know being the first person or being the author who who who's was kind of responsible for ushering in black queerness to middle grade is just something that means a lot to me so um i want to just uh, go ahead and start reading um just some of the background of this novel and why i decided to write it um and this is part of the letter that i kind of sent to booksellers about the book um, when I was young, I always thought about what it would be like to go on a fantasy adventure where magic was possible and where I was not constrained by the limits of time and space. As a voracious reader and a victim of school bullying, slipping into other worlds was a form of escape for me. My mother would buy me fantasy novels for Christmas, even though most times we didn't have enough money for anything extra. She understood that reading would not only provide me an escape from my daily world, but it would also give me to also give me an escape into the supernatural, the fantasy and the horror. My large imagination opened me up to writing in high school. I started out with taking stories I already knew and adding to them, creating alternate endings or reworking chapters that I didn't like and crafting new stories from them. These, these stories prepared me for writing my own work as I was transitioning from high school to college. In those times, I wasn't sure if my story ideas, story ideas would be taken seriously especially in a world where books by Black authors about the Black experience with Black characters were not normative. When I went to college, it was the first time I was finding out what it meant to be Black. It was then I decided that I wanted to put everything I had learned from writing about, from writing from fan fiction and of reading from my experience of home, school and home to the test. It was through these lands that I started crafting Cameron Battle at the Hidden Kingdoms, a story about a Black boy named Cameron who loses his parents too early. And through that loss, Cameron finds not only the African history that his grandmother has told him about his entire life, but he also finds love in his male best friend, Zion, and finds out that the fantastical, fictional, evil African world that his parents and grandparents told him about was all real. In the book, Cameron's parents read to him from what they say is a magical book that details Igbo mythology and says that it has been passed down for generations and generations and that their family holds the book now. They even tell him that the stories inside the book are all factual, that the stories of gods and goddesses, mythical objects and creatures, and the kings and queens are all true. Although Cameron doesn't believe in their stories, he does believe in his parents and loves them unconditionally. 
However, this all changes when his parents die at the age of 10 and his grandmother bars him from the magical book and locks it away in the attic. Two years later, his best friends, Zion and Aaliyah, dare him to go upstairs to the attic to read the book once again, because they tell him that the book belongs to him, especially now after his parents have died. When he takes them upstairs to read from it, a portal opens in the walls of the attic, leading to the fabled country of Shadani. Cameron Battle and the, and the Hidden Kingdoms has been an amazing experience and exercise in learning who I am. I wrote Cameron in the same vein of myself, a Black queer boy who has a love for reading, who uses reading as a form of escape into fantasy worlds, and who finds his historical positioning based on his experiences. It is my hope that Cameron can inspire other Black queer boys to love themselves as they are, instead of who others want them to be. Writing this book allowed me to see myself, and I'm so happy to share that with you, and I'm so happy to share that with readers, and I'm so, and I'm especially happy to share that with Black queer boys who are just searching to find themselves. Um, the last thing I want to say is, and I'll show the cover one more time because it's just so pretty, it's just so amazing. Um, I just want to thank all the indie booksellers across the U.S. who have made this book um, part of the Indies Introduce um, list for the Winter Spring uh, 2022. I'm so excited for this book to be in your bookstores. I cannot wait to come out and sign books and meet, meet kids and meet Black boys and just show them all about you know, what Karen Ballard, The Hidden Kingdoms is all about. And just to show them that they, that they're loved, that even though they may go through a lot, like probably, even though a lot of them may go through the same bullying and school bullying and home bullying that I went, went through, I wrote this book, not only for me, but for kids like Cameron who are struggling. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's an incredible cover and an incredible story inside it. Um, I think I'm not the only one who feels so incredibly inspired and excited about all of these stories. Thank you to all of our amazing authors for speaking today. And thank you for your, all of you booksellers who came to see us.